Okay, I apologize sincerely to, for the delay in the first uh, in ten, uh, tentative of starting this uh, short communication. I would like to thank Professor Santilli for the opportunity and Madame Santilli and my colleague, uh, Professor Christian Corda, for him, having done this effort to having me here to exchange with you this a few comments on basically the work regarding Professor Santilli and the idea of the existence of the iso redshift and related uh, conclusions. I, have, I will focus on this point because I am a relativistic astrophysicist. I've been all the time working in fields involving the concept of relativity, the concept of redshift, and the concept of cosmology. So I hope that my short uh, comments will contribute to the exciting discussion that we have been uh, having and hearing here over these days. I am an open mind scientist and I just have a strong binarily confident that an open mind is what makes the human mind to go in the right direction and to do the right thing in inquiring the universe and inquiring nature. My point of view is that as Galileo perhaps, or perhaps as Lagrangian, I like to be more confident that science is fundamentally an empirical law, uh, physics in particular, or fundamentally physics is an empirical science, and it deserves not only to be confirmed by experiments, but also, but also to be fundamented on a well-posed theory. And by theory, I mean a principle or a one idea based on a principle of action that we can elaborate to construct the dynamics of the system we are interested in describing and to extract consequences of social ideas. This is my point here. I will just use, since I, I was elaborating a more standard presentation and it was taking me too much time, I couldn't finish it for this opportunity, but I would like, and I hope to pass to Professor Santilli in the days to come for him to distribute to everyone in a more standard uh, uh, fashion to do it. I will use uh, a, a few papers in which the concept of redshift is essential for discussing about the universe, about the implications of relativistic theories or alternative theories to Einstein relativity. This is my uh, main point from now on. Uh, when I was invited by Professor Santilli to come to participate in these discussions, I suggested to him or to the interlocutor in this moment a uh, subject or a title for the topic I would like to discuss in this uh, symposium. And related to this, I would like to start with this uh, uh, essay. As I mentioned, I've been, since many, many years, I've been working on relativistic astrophysics, on cosmology, and in particular in the field that uses gamma ray bursts as a fundamental tool for inquiring the universe. Gamma ray bursts are understood as the huge or largest explosions in the universe. As compared to supernovae explosions, gamma ray bursts produce at most 100 more power than standard supernovae. I mean, they produce on the order of 10 to 53 Earths, while a standard supernovae produces uh, something like one fold, as used to say our uh, professor Fowler, 151 uh, Earth. Uh, the idea of using gamma reverse to use as a standard candle in cosmology is not relatively new, but not also as ancient as we would like to. The problem is that as different as compared to supernovae, gamma ray bursts are very difficult to catch 
on the flight and in addition are much difficult to be uh, observed with an associated galaxy because as you said, as you understand, looking at, at GRBs, at gamma radiation, is a very, very difficult task and then we need to put our technology, our knowledge to create instruments appropriate for doing the right way, uh, the right work in the right way and to look at almost at the same time to the radiation in gamma rays and to the, let's say, in a space coincident source which, which can uh, uh, ascribe to a galaxy or a uh, host galaxy. So uh, the essential in studying gamma ray bursts is basically for doing cosmologies, basically to, to infer from the observations the redshift. If this is a fundamental property in the universe. Professor Santilli argues in his uh, theory that the concept of redshift is modified by the introduction of the ISO, all the related theory that he has been developing over the last year, which is a very new idea for me. I am a newcomer to his idea and I am happy for that because we need to know what almost everyone is doing about discovering and inquiring the universe. And I, are really, I am really interested in understanding what is really hidden behind the idea of the ISO red shift, the ISO blue shift, and the ISO north shift. If these ideas are really a part of nature, they should be supported not only by the experience, but also by a fundamented first principle argument. And that's what I'm wanting to do. This is just to show you that over the last year I have been looking to the idea of doing cosmology by using gamma ray bursts as a kind of a standard candles. It's different, the use of gamma ray bursts as compared to the use of supernovae to do cosmology because exactly the problem is that as supernovae, gamma ray bursts are not easy to be standardized. And then we need to take care in the use for the time being in doing cosmology. But we have done some progress in this direction. And this is a kind of example. And as I was commenting, when I suggested my topic, the one I would like to discuss was confronting the Santilli's isorectif idea with observations of gamma reverse. This was my suggestion. But it was a suggestion that I modified a bit and just to try to look what could be the consequences of the factual, as Professor Santilli argues, demonstration of the isorectif phenomena. If this is true, well, we are in another context, we are putting science in another status and we need to rethink if there are this kind of uh, actual behavior in nature, we need to rethink many, many things that we have been discussing over almost 100 years since, since Einstein's formulation of general relativity. But to discuss cosmology with GRBs, because the problem is the red shift, we need to construct the Hubble diagram. Why is the Hubble, the Hubble diagram? Essentially, the Hubble diagram is a plot in which you confront the luminosity, absolute luminosity of a source, of a distant source, with its relative if this property is an actual behavior, an actual property of the universe. And the consequence is a standard Cartesian diagram. I just would like to show one of those, let's say, One of those like here, with the name full luminosity receives a, a very similar technical name, but this is essentially this axis, which is called the distance modulus. And here, as you can see clearly, you have the redshift. So if the redshift is really 
an idea or an a property of the universe that, according to Professor Santilli, need to be reviewed, well, we are in serious problems, and that is why, in my particular view, I would like to understand much better the, the basis of the Professor Santilli's idea of the isoredship and isoblue chip, etc., concepts which are very interesting indeed. So, what is a Hubble diagram? is counting, is telling us about the history of the universe, about the history of the expansion of the universe. And this is having us, as, uh, not exactly as Professor Santilli used to say, not exactly as we are at the center of the universe, but we are a reference frame, which need to, we, it's natural to use it as a way to measure objects that are far away from us. This is just, uh, a way, a natural way to do a piece of inquiring of the, on the evolution of the universe. But the key piece is these concepts, which I am extremely, extremely motivated to much carefully study professor ideas and, uh, regarding this isoredship, because if this is, his idea is correct, and there is really such characteristic in the universe so we need to review not only this aspect of inquiring about the expansion of the universe, but also to discuss the whole way of understanding on the universe that we have today. That is just to say that it's really exciting, and I think it's a good moment having this, this intriguing idea of the non-existing of the cosmological redshift which is the concept which belongs to the Hubble diagram of, uh, in this case, gamma ray base, but also we have plotted in some of these also uh, supernovae, which are more understood as good st standard candles, and then we, we plot against those data which are represented by these points here with the error bars, red and blue, et cetera, these are the error bars, against some theories of the universe that is something that we have today. We have many, many theories inspiring several uh, forms in Einstein general relativity, and they are uh, plotted again against this data in order to say, well, hey, look, this is something that perhaps has really something to do with what the universe is doing indeed over his expansion. Well, uh, I have been working on gamma ray bursts since the very early days I was a uh, grad student. Uh, I was a grad student in, in, in until 1998, and my first paper was this paper on, on PRL, in which a kind of gamma ray bursts, which is called the soft gamma ray repeaters, was my subject at that moment. And I was looking at a standard gamma ray bursts. Well, I said, these objects are, seems to be galactic ones. And being galactic, I have no trouble with the idea of wretched in principle. I have been on the idea of doing cosmology with GRB since many, many years, but there was the troubles I just mentioned that those objects were not understood at proper standard candles, so you cannot use it confidentially in the Hubble diagram we, we were discussing uh, for, uh, uh, previously. So in, in these days, these objects are understood to be galactic sources. And then, for me, it was interesting at that moment to look at the characteristic astrophysical properties of this object, and then I start to look further out, inspired or fundamented in relativistic cosmology. Just, this just to show that the field of gamma ray bursts is part of my, my research since many, many years ago. Uh, recently, we with my colleagues, I, I am researching 
at the Brazilian Center for Research in Physics in Rio de Janeiro, and also I was collaborating at the International Center for Relativistic Astrophysics at the University of Rome and at the Center in Pescara in Italy, collaborating with many people, among them our friend Professor Remo Ruffini. This work is part of the thesis of my Brazilian student, uh, Jurassi, which is also related to GRBs, and in particular, in the way they are distributed over the universe. That property of how many of those objects called gamma ray bursts do exist and how they are distributed over cosmological scales. That characteristic is defined by the astrophysical concept called luminosity function. We use this idea to inquire about how the universe has been evolving since the early days. But if a standard cosmology is correct and what it has been showing us over the late years, we are confident that the concept which is again behind this luminosity function, which is the concept of redshift, is a fundamental piece for understanding the universe. But if Professor Santilli is right, then once again, this kind of concept needs to be reviewed and behind of those, all of the other concepts that are hidden, which are not the case to discuss here, just to motivate my uh, arguments and my elements to, as a contribution to this interesting discussion in this symposium. But the key point is that here is hidden the concept of Redshift. And if you look at almost, as Professor uh, Paul uh, Laviolette was already showing us in his discussions yesterday and today, of course, the concept of evolution of the universe in, in any respect was all, also included, although he was not claiming about expansion, in, instead arguing in favor of a almost stationary universe, if I understood correctly, right? But here is hidden the concept of redshift and the concept of expansion and the concept of evolution of the universe. So when I need to say what's happened then with the Professor Santilli idea. I mean, we respect my understanding of cosmology and the universe according to the observations. Most of those analyses are based, of course, in data collected by instruments, in this case the VAXE, which is an ancient already uh, uh, not useful uh, discarded for doing observations. And the, in the last article, in the, the former article, we presented data from the SWIFT satellite and I have many other papers in this direction doing the same thing. So uh, my, my, my worry is that you need to go to construct a diagram in which the property of red shift should appear, like here. You see, these plots represent uh, the characteristic uh, a cosmological concept we call the luminosity function, and once again here is the redshift. If we need to review such a concept, we need to review much of our understanding of the universe. What is my way to address such a suggestion by Professor Santilli? Well, as we used to say, I, I am convinced that Galileo Galilei was a real scientist in the most expressive uh, interpretation or understanding of the subject. And he said, well, 
it's not enough to look at the Jovian satellites. It's important not only to follow the orbits around Jupiter, it's important to understand how they orbit so stationary, so all, quite, almost perfectly around this object, in as much at the same time as the planets do around the sun. And how to do that? Well, in the days, not even Newtonian gravitation was already existing, so some time we need to spend for having a good theory, at least to understand in the first approximation what happened there. But then Newtonian mechanics, as maybe someday Hadronic mechanics will achieve such statues, need to be put in a more fundamental level of as a theoretical physics uh, formulation. And that is simple. It's just to write what do you call the action, let's say, with all the variables that we can put into this object called Lagrangian. The action is the principle of how to say more properly something about a system, whatever it is, in biology, in condensed matter, in astrophysics, or in cosmology. We need to ask about what is the dynamics of such objects. In this respect, I offer my apologies to Professor Santilli in particular, and to all of you that much better than me are familiar with his ideas, because I am just coming into discussing and studying those elements, but I need to clearly fix my viewpoint. I would like to defend a theoretical argument as the isorectic idea of Professor Santini, if I can do perfect, clear, testifiable predictions based on a principle of action. I am not saying that I didn't believe that he already did that. As I said, I, I, I needed to find the proper reference where those analyses were presented. But I would like to have this dynamical element in order to do my own analysis as a good scientist would do with his view, with his understanding, trying to achieve the same conclusions as Professor Santilli ha has arrived to. So I think it, this dynamic ingredient is important to have it in hand. I offer, once again, my excuses. I need to follow those, those words that you mentioned to us earlier. But I would like especially to look for the elements, the dynamical equations that could lead me into the right way to see that the iso red shift, iso blue shift, or iso not shift are properties that I can produce. I can do a producer over and then say, well, this is really something that in nature need to be properly taken into account. Uh, in the meantime, since I just had the chance to look at some of those references that he kindly offered me to look at, uh, and inspired in his lecture here since the very first day, and also in Professor Korda's first lecture in the in a introductory lecture of this symposium, I was motivated to study more carefully at least this paper. This paper is published in the Journal of Computational Methods in Science and Engineering, uh, volume 12, page 141 and 2012. In this paper, the first equation is a description of an Isominkovskian 
uh, space time in which for these four parameters or parameters that Professor Sartilli already was discussing in his lectures and also in some sense Professor called that advanced in the, in, the, in the sense he was discussing a fundamental quantity that you said as you state that it is the ISO unit is a fundamental piece of your ideas on all, almost all your theories. And I was looking at this equation and the related one, which is the second equation that gives you what Professor Santilli calls general ISO law for discussing the change in frequencies. And this depends, of course, on those, uh, let's say, components of the space-time, uh, Minkowski Santilli ISO space-time. But my point is, just to be more direct into my inquiries. If I understood properly when you were discussing the concept of ISO units and the possibility of using it for uh, producing cryptograms for applications in, like in, in the, let's say, banks and so on, uh, financial affairs, you were pointing to a very important element from my point of view, which regards, in my view, much about my questions and inquiries about the use and use, uh, introduce, introduction and use of the ISO redshift and related concepts which we are discussing here. In this equation, in this Minkowski Santilli ISO space time, there appeared four numbers, which are N1, N2, N3, and N4. Of course, in a line element, they are square for standard, standardize the, the, uh, uh, the metric. But as I was telling you, if I do not remember wrongly, I remember that you clearly said the ISO unit is a fundamental piece, and it is such that I can change it in, a, in its internal structure in such a way that I can put numbers in order, for example, to construct the ISO numbers that Professor Corda was discussing. You can put, you can introduce some new ISO unit so that you have a new sequence of numbers. And you clearly show that, for example, two times three is not six, as everyone needs to think about, because if you, it depends on which ISO unit you put in. Am I right or am I wrong? That's what I understood. OK, if I am, if I am wrong, excuse me, but uh, this is an, an element that is here. Because I understood also that the ISO unit is related to the numbers N1, N2, 2, N4. And if this number, this fundamental unit, can be constructed, let's say, in quotations, arbitrarily, I cannot understand how we can then proceed to the next step and state or uh, formulate like a theorem, the argument saying that the ISO redshift exists in the sense that, uh, that it could be univocally defined. This is my understanding. If you can introduce different ISO units where the numbers N1 to N4 can be different, I apologize to repeat, but I cannot understand how can I do a pertinent or proper prediction of what redshift or what not red, ISO redshift or what not ISO blue chip can I go to measure. This is my, my first point. I, I then want to look at, at, the, at this uh, same paper. There are, there are another papers, but just to go into the same line, if 
the Professor Santilli argument is correct, the Eistor redshift can exist, let's say as the first understanding states, you have Eistor redshift when, a light, when light is passing through a medium in which it can't deliver energy into, right? And you have isoblutive when a light is traveling through a medium in which it can collect or receive energy from the medium. And you have isonotive when there is no exchange of energy any, any, any more, anymore. So if this is the case, then the conclusion of exporting the idea of the non-existence, the redshift as we understood in this kind of cosmology where this quantity with this cosmological parameter which is properly inferred from dynamical equations in Einstein theory, you can properly understood what is Z, which is the time derivative over the escape of the of the escape factor over the escape factor, and this is a quantity which comes into the metric of the space time in, that goes into Einstein's equation. So, and then here you have the geometry, which is something that Professor Santilli is used to emphasize. It's important to understand the properties, the geometrical properties of a theory, and here they are hidden. But my point is, if the isorative implies that this one that relates to the growing with time of the scale factor is not an actual property of the universe, then what is the universe in this? And that is related to my last question to Paul when I asked about the possible correlation between the matter creation in your theory, so quantum uh, kinetics, with regard to the Olbers paradox. Because if you don't have a way of leakage energy from the universe, I mean, that may imply that there exists some extra dimensions, I don't know how to avoid the moment in which being creating, over-creating, will not make the universe to implode, auto-implode. But this is another point. The point. My point is, if this property is not a fact, is not an observational fact, the universe, I, I presume that Professor Santilli admits that the universe is, is built or is a constructed or is formed with this large object which is largely separated with which we call galaxies and, and cluster of galaxies and so on. But then, if this number doesn't exist because what it means is that the distance between two points in the space-time is changing with time, it could be change, it could be going with time or decreasing with time, then this has no sense. This has no sense, and then we need to restart again. The humankind has restarted several times. Before, after the Galilean, after the Greek, ancient Greek time, after the, the Oscurantism time, after the Inquisition time, which is related to your worry about the current trend in our science today, because there are some partners that appears that they don't like, not even to, let's say, to uh, attempt to introduce a reflection, a discussion on fundamental issues what that regards uh, nature or the universe. So to make more clear my point, if this doesn't exist, there is no expansion at all, but the galaxies are separated up and down or there, over there, and etc. 
the universe is large, then what is what we are measuring, for example, when a supernova explodes? We collect light here, and from that intensity, and from that uh, spectrum, and from that integrated spectrum, we infer most of the properties regarding such explosions, like, for example, the whole energy that was produced during that explosion. And that, we say that because light takes some time and travels through space, and this, the, sec the law of inverse square of distance allows us to say, oh, well, if this is the case, with no redshift, but the inverse law of distance, that energy was 10 to the 51 air, almost. But then, the problem is that supernovae that, that, that do not explode in an isolated region of a space. Supernovae explodes almost everywhere inside a galaxy. And in a galaxy, you have gas, as you were saying, that this mechanism of creation can work properly. But let's say, in the, in the galaxy, there exists gas. And if the iso redshift doesn't exist for the expansion of the universe, well, as I said, I may concede that you could be right, and I cut out this element. But I have another way out. Let's admit that there is no expansion at all, which is clearly, by the way, is not a recent argument only by Professor Santilli. In your own paper in 1986, you also question about the actual fact of the expansion of the universe. But it's not only you and many others. Einstein also said, what the hell is, excuse me, the word. What that means is expanding the universe. He was upset with such an idea. And Ten. they introduced the cosmological constant to say, hey, where about? Let's stop that way. 10 minutes. OK, thank you. And then you can go a bit further and consider that the iso redshift uh, requirements, admitting that there is no expansion at all, but the explosion of a gamma ray burst of a supernova takes place inside a galaxy. And light from those explosions need to travel through the intergalactic space. And then in this intergalactic space can do the same work that you said in the outer relative uh, theory could be also a way to lose energy while traveling through, and then you, in some sense, you can recover the notion of the iso redshift, but look, there is no expansion at all right now. But the photons need to travel, or the electromagnetic waves need to travel through the intergalactic space, and once again, you have the condition for having iso redshift, iso blue chip, et cetera, because it's natural. There are regions in a galaxy where there are a lot of gas, like near the center of a, of, of a galaxy, like near the, cloud, the nucleus, or the core, or the bulge of the galaxy, and in the outscale of the galaxy, there is almost no gas at all. Otherwise, the galaxy will be infinitely extensive. So, in my view, if I admit that there is no up dot eight, but there is gas in a galaxy, and when the light passes through, it will experiment, it will undergo the same effect and the same uh, uh, situation that you can find for having the iso redshift with the mechanism that you suggest is, con is releasing gas in a medium because the density is high enough with respect to some fundamental quantity. This is one I need to understand, which is that one. Or you, you will receive light or energy from that medium because the medium has density lower than that fundamental threshold. That's what I'm interested to understand. But I suspect that if I concede that there is no dot eight, then either 
the gas in the galaxy can do the same work, or we definitely need to restart again to do cosmology. I think it, that condensed state my inquiry. I just want go to finish by saying about one possibility, which is regarding to the extension of the isorective idea, that there is no rectif at all related to the scale factor evolution in time, if there is no this property in the universe, then we need to rethink how to explain the same phenomena, because data, I may concede, once again, I repeat, I may concede, I'm not convinced, I may concede that dot date is zero, but then we need to think about where this idea of dot A different from zero come from. And it comes from, from Einstein theory, for example, and this is clearly very easy to compute and to infer and to get this number. I would like to have an ISO Minkowski, non an ISO Minkowski, one for a curved space time, one Minkowski, Santilli, let's say Riemann Santilli uh, line element, to try to see from this, not to look for something like this. What comes out? from the ratio of the G00 component to the G11 component or to the G00 component over there and the G00 component over here. If this can be done with your theory, I will be happy and I will say Professor Santilli was fully correct. In the meantime, I just want to point to one possibility. You, Paul was arguing in favor of one idea Maybe the way to produce matter in the universe is that way. Creation like in, in Hoyle and Burbage and Narlikan, etc. Maybe you are almost, almost, not exactly, but almost in the same direction. But let's say if, if I don't like too much Einstein theory, I, I'm just showing this as an example of thinking, you know, a scientific thinking not an uh, absolute claim that this is the way out. I'm just saying that this is an interesting way to understand how to proceed when we are facing such a huge problems. In this work with Professor Corda and my colleague in Colombia, we study a way out to the problem of dark matter that you said after discussing the isorective, et cetera, concepts, you said, also, that's not necessary to think about because having no need for relative and related concepts that you clearly state, related concepts, ideas, or conjectures, you can forget about that and you can proceed to reconstruct your whole view of the universe with no dark matter. In my view, and according to our agreement with Professor Corda and the other colleagues, for example, one can change Einstein gravity. I don't like Einstein too much, okay. I concede, let's change Einstein. I change Einstein this way. In Einstein theory, this way is, this L is R. This R comes here, come here. And in this idea, there is no R, but rather R squared. This is another theory. And we can build many other ways of those. We can generalize. Instead of R squared or R, we can use F of R, let's say, a general function of R. And we can do. One minute. And this is a very interesting way. But the, the important thing by using this approach is that you can provide to me dynamics with which I can make calculations, I can make analysis, and I can make predictions on what to look for out there in the universe. This is what I was to propose for contributing to this interesting discussion in this symposium. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Mosquera Costa. Questions, please. Professor Ogan, Mosquera Costa, compliments because your 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 presentation is extremely mature, very scientific, and in the very essence of science. Namely, you pose open questions. And that's the very, very essence of science, the very, very essence of uh, advancing. Now, you ask many, many questions. You, all very beautiful, all very exciting. Um, the, 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 um, uh, let's address first the, 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 issue, the implications, your invitation here to at least uh, hint at what are the implications of the isolated shift in astrophysics and cosmology. I understand there are two, a couple of uh, astrophysicists already working on this. I'm reporting to, um, to you the prelim preliminary, preliminary. But first, let's review what, <coughs> let's separate the experimental evidence at this moment <coughs> from the theory. The theory is a completely separate issue. The experimental evidence, to the best of my knowledge, after many, many years, this thing started in 1991. The, the experimental evidence is that um, electromagnetic waves lose energy to a cold medium, cold transparent, a cold gas. This seems to be co confirmed now, even yesterday was confirmed by measuring yesterday. There are independent verifications. The entire spectrum of light is shifted. So the, the hypothesis of the absorption for the, red for the redness of the sun is disproved in our world. You look at the spectrum of the sun. Orthodox physicists, particularly people who, uh, who support Einstein, claim that you look at the entire spectrum at the zenith, the blue is scattered, and the red uh, remains, so therefore we read red. This, is, this hypothesis is dramatically disproved by experimental evidence because the, bad, the red band is dramatically shifted 200 to sometimes 300 nanometers. So there is no possibility. I didn't address the problem of the no, no, how I know. wide no, no, this no, no. is. I know, but I want to, so the experimental evidence is that to, at this moment, until disproved by counter experiment. So that's why we strongly object against the theoretical mambo jumbo. No, <clears throat> an experimental evidence published in referee journals after long, long examine, studies and examine, can only be disproved by counter experiment. The experimental evidence at this moment that has to let me admit is that electromagnetic waves lose energy to, 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 to a medium, <coughs> and supposedly if it is cold. If the medium is very hot, they acquire energy. Now, this is in yeah, Earth. My association with this no, no, is please, please do not interrupt me. Please do not interrupt simple me. Simple thermodynamics. No, no, please do not interrupt me. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. I lose my train of thoughts. Let me talk. And then I want to, I'm very interested to hear your comment. Because I want to bring to the conclusion. If you interrupt me, then we end up in a minestrone, no, no, please. in a big minestrone. Because the topics are many, many, many. We have to be focused. So the experimental earth, uh, evidence, let me restart. The experimental evidence on, on, on our atmosphere, light loses energy. Now, the next clear experimental evidence, let's pass now to the, uh, the cosmos. The clear experimental evidence is that intergalactic um, spaces are not totally empty. Since they're not totally empty, there is, uh, there is matter that is very rarefied. But at, at millions of light years of distance, <laughs> even uh, one, uh, one atom per cubic meter makes a huge, huge medium. As a result of this, <clears throat> since there is a medium at an intergalactic distance, then, uh, there are serious doubts that the, Min the Minkowski geometry is correct. And therefore, there are very serious doubts that the Doppler effect is, is correct at the intergalactic due to the medium. In other words, physical laws have to be the same everywhere and th through the universe. If electromagnetic waves lose energy to, 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 to our atmosphere, to our gas, and ladies and gentlemen, then the, the light emitted by faraway galaxy must lose energy to the intergalactic medium. Otherwise, we have one law. That's what most, most of the dark side of science they do. No, oh, we have one law for the for the for the, uh, cosmological relation and another law for 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 uh, for the sun. No, this this is not serious science. There has to be if the, if experiment. Uh, this is Galileo. You mentioned Galileo. Let's do the experiments on Earth before applying them to the cosmos. That's what I did. Galileo is my mentor. So the evidence at the at the, in the, at the galactic level is that. Um, light emitted from galaxy 
according to, to measurements on Earth, light emitted by um, a galaxy must lose energy to the intergalactic medium. That's not my idea, that's a weak idea. The, the, um, professor, um, la, la, professor, our colleague who came here, the, the, La Violette, has independently proved uh, many years ago that uh, indeed the Zwick idea fits the data beautifully, uh, much, more, much more than the expansion. So independently for those measurements on Earth, in the, in the, independently from those measurements on Earth, that according to the experimental evidence on Earth, light loses energy to a medium, then Professor um, Violet are uh, independent verified that this hypothesis fits the, the, the experimental data on the uh, uh, cosmological redshift uh, in, a, in, a, in a way better than the other. In other words, is the evidence that we have to admit at this moment until disproved by other counter experiment on Earth. <laughs> now, let's see. So this is the evidence. We have to admit it. At least it's, look, it is what it appears to now. Now, let's see the consequences. That was why you, why you are here. The consequences are, <laughs> it gives you the, the good span. You, you, you hinted more than once. The, um, that's what I'm told by those astrophysicists working on this issue. The moment they saw the paper on the ISO redshift and the measurements on Earth, forget the theory, forget at this moment completely the theory, the measurement. Then um, basically the, the totality of the number, the numerical value that we, that astrophysics has, has uh, identified have to be revised. The totality, with no exception that I know at this moment. This may, first of all, the distance of a galaxy. The distance is based, uh, based on, uh, is based on, uh, on uh, the Doppler's effect, the red shift and then, um, and the, 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 so the, the, the distance of galaxy, the first element has to be revised. But you made, uh, made uh, mention a, um, a point. For instance, let's see one case specifically the, to see how, uh, how this thing goes all over the spectrum. You mentioned this ga gamma burst that they emit 10 to a number. You said the number 10 to the 53, I believe, ergs. Is that correct? Yes. Now, that number has to be revised. Why so? Because that, um, that burst occurred in a galaxy. Now, that, um, that, uh, now, um, the, that galaxy, the, the distance of, uh, that was, um, was, up, uh, was estimated based on, on, the, on, the, on the Doppler effect. Now, if the red shift is, co uh, the, uh, according to the evidence, is correct, what it implies? It implies that that gamma burst at the origin uh, uh, is in enormously more powerful than 10 to the uh, 53. Uh, Earths. Why? Because it lost the energy. The energy was, has been lo most of the energy has been lost, or the significant percentage of energy, not all, has been lost during the trap. So that number, 10 to the 53, has to be re-examined. Has to be re-examined. Uh, uh, re-examined for uh, for uh, for uh, once we you take into account that, uh, that there is no expansion. The distance is essentially you know there is no major uh, no major expansion. There may be local motion. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> and therefore you have to factor out factor out the factor out the the the, the, the energy you have to compute the energy at the origin. Finally, <clears throat> now the, the the question of the, the, the burst is immensely more complicated. Is rendered by the by the uh, those measurement here is um, what uh, renders enormously more complicated is not so normal, the isolated shift. Is the iso blue shift? <clears throat> Why so? Because it now is another experimental evidence that when light passes through the very hot uh, 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 gas, we have measured this routinely. Come back to our lab and measure yourself. Light acquires energy in, the, uh, in, in, in a blue shift. Then what does it mean? It means lots of the complication of the problem is enormous because those gammas, those gammas, first of all, they, um, they, they, um, they, they, they pass through a very hot gas, so they acquire energy. And, um, but the, 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 so when you com uh, combine all those corrections, the corrections due to, to, the, to, the, um, to the correction due to the loss of energy during the travel, then you combine the, the, the iso blue shift internally in the gamma, the, the numbers that you come up, uh, come up are, are, are mind-blocking because it may end up to be 100, uh, 10 to the 100 ergs when you combine everything together. And it will take years and years and years to, to, to sort out all this. Conclusion, and I want to hear your, your opinion. On one point only, however, because you had so many beautiful things, I will stay with you for a year. The, one point only. 
let's assume that it is indeed experimental evidence, light loses energy when travel in a, in a plant. And that um, Zwicky idea that, uh, that uh, the tidal light is, is correct. Therefore, you agree that, uh, that the totality of um, astrophysical data have to be revised. You agree on this, on the, that assumption. That's what I said. <laughs> I need to be myself convinced that the actual, the iso red chip or the iso blue chip is an actual property of nature. I mean, you said light release energy when traveling through a cold medium, let's say. And conversely, gains energy when traveling through a hot medium. The other way around, you can call vice versa. But the point is, in any case, in nature, the process will take place. I mean, be gaining energy or be releasing energy. If this is the case, it's not in immediately con a conclusion can be drawn that all the concepts, the astrophysical concepts that we use today need fundamentally to be reviewed. As, because as I tell you, I concede that A dot is zero. But since there is gas, not only in the galaxy, but in, even as you have already said and confirmed, through the intergalactic space, the process of releasing energy in that case is clear because the temperature in, of, over the intergalactic space has been measured very, very well, uh, uh, let's say, with numbers very well defined. And we know that that temperature is low, as you were mentioning, near the CMB temperature, just to say a number which is familiar with everyone here. So light from a galaxy, which is light from blue star, yellow stars, red stars, is for sure much hot than the temperature over the intergalactic medium. And in that case, light should be release it onto the medium. And the ISO redshift will be properly operating, not because there is an expansion, but I mean the redshift or the, in the other sense, not the ISO redshift, but it will be related to the ISO redshift or the redshift in the standard cosmology in some sense will be recovered because loss of energy will, will, to, will take place once again. And then we said, okay, the mechanism is not the expansion of the universe, but the mechanism is at the loss, iso rate. Loss of the, but loss of that's the... what I need. If I need to, the way to confirm that the mechanism, to separate that the mechanism is due to expansion of the universe rather than to release of energy onto the intergalactic space. I need the way to do that. That's what I, and I'm asking you. Tell me how to do it. Well, I can reproduce the experiment. No. Oh, yes, the experiment can be reproduced in many variations and so on. Actually, we are funding the independent repetition of uh, the experiment. It can be done in many, many ways. Oh, yes, uh, I told you, excuse me, just briefly. I just no. already said to you, I just offered my, my interest in reproducing your experiment in Rio de Janeiro sure. in order to see we, what we, um, is really yeah. there. The first, there is, a, you know, there is a, a pro, uh, an issue of, of proving or disproving our, uh, the, the measurement available until now. They also have to be redone in exactly the same condition to, 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 have a, to be a proof or a disproof. But in addition to that, the there are of many, science. many variations. There are many, many variations because um, think about a, a, la, a, a laser, laser in air. You measure the laser nearby and you go a mile away and you can see the, you can see. It. There are many, many ways in which the experiment is a very simple experiment and it is incontrovertible. The, the, you calibrate um, the, 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 the wavelength analyzer at the source and then you go far away and you see clearly the, it is, uh, I will, tomorrow, uh, Thursday mo Sunday morning, I will, uh, but since it, I see that they've not been perceived by most of the audience, I will reflash them uh, again. I want to touch one point, uh, one point I want, sorry, because I have to leave, uh, because I have an invitation at another talk, I have to leave in a couple of minutes. So that's why I would like to finish a conversation with us. Uh, 
There is one delicate point that you raised. You raised all your points, Professor. They're beautiful. You really touched. You made a long, magnificent list of open problems, which is, for me, beautiful science stimulates the solution. There is one issue, however, which is um, in this uh, expected, what, quote unquote, revision of all numbers in the astrophysics, there is one aspect that is very delicate. And that is the reason why I invited, I got the money to Professor Verrault to come here. And uh, <coughs> to hear, uh, because he's an expert in the field, and I want to hear a dissident view. Not, he has not been invited to present, to have a supportive view. <coughs> the, the issue is pertaining the relationship between the, between, um, the, the shift of frequencies versus the shift of intensities. And the, now, I have to, uh, at this point, we have to, we have to go back uh, to, to, to axiom, you, um, to basic axiom. I believe uh, Minkowski space in, in empty space, Minkowski space in empty space is uh, exactly valid. Now, from that axiom, you derive one uh, law, the Doppler shift, frequency shift, Doppler frequency shift. There is no theoretical prediction or axiomatic prediction whatsoever from the Minkowski space toward the intensity. No, nothing, zero. It zero. relates only to frequency? Only to frequency. Wavelength. Oh, wavelength, wavelength, of course. Frequency or wavelength yeah, is yeah. the same. Wavelength, the, what, that's what we measure. Now, under isotopy, under isotopy, remember my words in the monolith, this mm -hmm. monolithic structure, when you do the isotopy, this point persists in its totality. When you do the isotopy, which means you go from empty space to a physical medium, think about intergalactic space, think about air, think about something else, the gas, in the, the gas surrounding a quasar. Once you do that isotopy, you have exactly the same thing. Namely, the axioms, that now appears to be verified, verified in all segments of fields. We have now experimental verification everywhere from, from A to Z. The axiom, <coughs> again, study and do a, do a prediction on the, freq on the wavelength, on the frequency. There is zero, zero prediction on the intensity. And that's why Professor Verrault is here. To now, what is so? What from this viewpoint? What, now, what um, for what I know, it is an unresolved, it's a central unresolved issue because your your uh, comment on the intensity is very, very important, very valuable, has to be addressed. The, now, from what we know at this moment, the the the, um, the, 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 the behavior, the description of the intensity is complementary. Uh, but not, uh, not, con uh, not uh, disruptive with respect to the frequency and vice versa. In other words, to have a complete description, even in air, let's go back to Galileo in air, let's do it in air. For me to have a complete description of the, what, uh, the behavior of light in air, I, I'm not entirely satisfied to only look at, um, at, the, at the frequency, uh, the variation of the frequency. No, I also need a description of the intensity. This is, a, this is physics. You need to describe everything. What, uh, the, um, so in, that's, in this way, the Rayleigh, Rayleigh and the other um, scattering, they play, um, the Professor Kai Wei has done fantastic work in this in elastic scattering that gives you the intensity. But my point, the, the best of my knowledge, the, the, um, the, the, um, there is a magnificent compatibility of the two. At this moment, I do not see, I do not see a discrepancy. Professor Verold has a different idea that I respect. And uh, in my opinion, however, the intensity too has to be revised. Because the moment the intensity, the intensity is based on frequency. If you look at the equation of the intensity for an, uh, for an intensity of light from an astrophysics uh, source, it's based on the frequency. Once you have to re revise the frequency, that's my understanding at this moment. Once you have to re revise the frequency because there is no relative motion and the, the same frequency at the origin is much bigger than what we measure here, the intensity has to be revised necessarily. So therefore, despite, um, the, despite uh, objection, the, the, despite objection, the conclusion remains that the totality of, let me put it in this way and then I stop. At, um, at least we can state at this moment, in my view, in the, this is one of the major conclusion or a point of this meeting. At, this, at least at this moment, on serious scientific grounds, on serious scientific grounds, our knowledge, numerical knowledge, astrophysical knowledge of the, of the universe is not certain. 
It's not certain. It cannot be claimed. This star is 3 billion years away, 10 to the 53 um, ergs. Those, um, the, the, all those numbers are not necessarily uh, true. That's what we, we should state for a scientific honesty. We have to see. Maybe they are true. Oh my God. Maybe what we, this shift is wrong. No, I may agree, yeah. but yeah. You, you need but, to, in a state, yes. upon. Yeah. My, yeah. My, recommend, yeah. explanation. my recommendation with you, the, if you are interested, you mentioned the action. Yes, we represent everything with, but not the action. Those, those interactions, the variation in non-self adjoint, you cannot represent with a Lagrange. That's Lagrange few points. No, it I is, remember that you said that it's not for yeah, no. your theory for non-Hamiltonian No, for non-Hamiltonian. Yeah, but, I know, but, but, but you have an ISO. Say, but, you have an I, but you have an ISO action. You have a covering notion of the action, and you can do everything. You can study this in my two volume of elements of hadronic mechanics uh, with. Uh, with, uh, with the Ukraine Academy mm -hmm. of Science. This, we see the entire theory that you ask has been done in all details. We will not be able to, well, to uh, have an operator image unless we have an, uh, a generalized form of action. It will not, be, will not have been possible. And I, I think I have to stop because I have to leave because I'm expecting that. Um, I apologize because I'm interested in, uh, Professor Garizin, perhaps you can tell me what, um, what uh, the, the discussions. Yes. Yeah. But I, I have an invitation at an important meeting. I apologize. Okay. We, no, thank you, Professor for uh, uh, for your comment. So uh, maybe uh, someone has question. Eh? I think uh, it's quite straightforward. Uh, one thing could be done: take the data, uh, the data from uh, that you published on the gamma ray burst, and uh, replot it for a tired light uh, stationary universe. This would be a start. For example, this is going to change the luminosities of the gamma ray bursts because you don't have the Doppler recession effect, which dims. And as a result, they're overestimating the luminosity, thinking that the, ga the galaxy is moving away. So you take that out. But then the distances change because in tired light universe, you're at, for a given redshift, you're further away. For example, it's redshift of six, you're probably twice as far away as uh, the Big Bang Theory would say, so there's a factor of four difference of figuring inverse square. Uh, we're you, coupling the two effects, so you, you would still come out that uh, you have to reduce the luminosity of your gamma ray burst, some, maybe mm -hmm. half of what you're assuming or a third, I don't know what it will be. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to replot that for this type of cosmology and I've done that with some data. In my book, I take what's uh, done for the relativistic view, and I rehash it to how would it be for tired light uh, stationary universe. And it ends up actually coming out more plausible. It, 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 uh, you have some positive effects when you do that. And maybe the Hadronic Journal would be interested to publish a paper like that. Uh, one other thing, I just want to make a correction, something you said in my th theory, that as you get more and more galaxies, you, you don't get a, a collapse because uh, uh, subquantum kinetics is consistent with the uh, MOND, Milgram's theory of a modified Newtonian dynamics. Uh, if you remember the graph, mm -hmm. gravity between the galaxies, as you notice, the gradient goes to zero because they're, they're creating G wells, but the uh, gravity yeah, yeah, potential yeah. is. Mm -hmm. uh, levels off. So you don't have to worry about uh, crunch into uh, yeah. in the future. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It, it was a comment or a question? It was more like a comment. Okay, yeah. thank you. Just to supplement your view regarding the issue of expansion or not, or dimming or not of some explosive events in the universe. We addressed in particular the problem regarding the supernovae that were used for claiming this famous uh, idea that leads some guys to be honored with the Nobel Prize in Physics because they discover the expansion, the reacceleration of the expansion of the universe. And just to make a quotation that in a different perspective regarding the view by Professor Santilli, we use another view to understanding the same problem. And we prove, as you look at this, pro at this plot, once again, 
in cos relativistic cosmology, you can plot the redshift against the value of the magnetic, of the strength of the magnetic field over intergalactic space. And look what's happened with the absolute redshift in relativistic cosmology. This is the scale. Look at the definition here, a modification, but we call effective because there is a, a factor extra here that depends on the value of the magnetic field over the intergalactic space. And look what's happened with the value of the redshift, which is one will be the normal redshift that give, it gives you by relativistic cosmology with no extra effect like the ones we are putting into in this analysis. With respect to the intensity of the magnetic field over the intergalactic space, respect with a fundamental constant, constant of nature. And this ratio is from zero to one. Look, you can go to actual zero relative, almost, well, almost, not exactly, because it, pops, it stops here. But close to zero relative, just by taking into account that light travels through intergalactic space where there is background magnetic field extremely low but light interact with them and that nonlinear process makes the whole light that arrives to you to be reduced and then the factor that you associate to the redshift goes down as much as intense will be the magnetic field in the medium so I can erase the said dimming of the supernovae by doing just this. And I just can show you very quickly how it works. Look at this, two pictures. Let me see. No, not there. What is that here? No, no. I just wanted to say, where is the back? No, just to make it easy. Go on down. Back. No, particular. Back. Speak up, please, sir. It may be this one. Oh, OK. Maybe this can help. Yeah. But the point is, look at these plots. This, the two, the, oh, my god. This one and the next one. If you compare. Look the horizontal scale, and look, I cut the error bars. I just put, put the points there, the squares and the stars. And look the position of those stars here. And you look that the Hubble diagram, the red line, the, the black line, these points move up and down according to the correction that I need to introduce to the actual redshift in my theory. And with this, I can put most of the data online or below the line that makes the guides to claim that there exists acceleration of the expansion of the universe with no dimming at all of the, any, any light, just because light interacts in the medium, but not with the matter, with the intergalactic space, and that reduces either the same intensity. And this is another point, please. Yeah, I just want to make a, a point, okay? Uh, it is well known in spectroscopy that different wavelengths behave totally differently in different medium, okay? Similarly, the reason why they did the superluminal uh, experiment this morning with the copper tube is because they use microwave, which has centimeter wavelength. You cannot pass light through a, a, a waveguide. You have to pass it through a fiber optics. I'm a gamma ray expert. I've been doing it for 20 years. It, it has totally different attenuation properties in different materials. So assuming you have the tired light, uh, which like I said, I'm actually, believe it or not, a supporter of that, but I'm an experimental physicist. I need to see experiment, you know, and to assume that uh, visible light and gamma rays have exactly the same, quote, attenuation of tight light is extremely, extremely dangerous in my view, I you know, agree. just I to agree. make that assumption. Oh, so for, for people to say or interpret this data and get this so it, it fits my result, that is to me also extremely, extremely dangerous. That's what got us into this problem in the first place. 
So I just want you to bear in mind that gamma rays do not behave like visible light. Okay, it absolutely does. It's electromagnetic, a totally different way, but in different medium, where it's cosmological you. medium, through a brick wall through my body, it behaves totally differently. And my presentation that if it's it high light, it will probably also behave totally differently in different media. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I have uh, two comments. The first is uh, uh, you have discussed um, only two extreme cases. The cases in which the presence of the, the ISO redshift by Professor Santilli removed the expansion, or alternative, there is expansion and there is no redshift. I think it is uh, quite intriguing that third possibility. Yeah, both of the expansion and the redshift are present. In fact, we, we uh, uh, must remember that. Uh, in the, in the present standard model of cosmology, not only like, no, uno solo, not only like Professor Mosquera Cuesta emphasizes that we have uh, R dot, where uh, no, uh, R, I prefer use A, A dot different from zero, but we have also A, A dot dot different to zero. Now, if the ISO redshift is not enough strong to, to put uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is not, uh, not consistent, but enough strong to delete this point, uh, uh, in that case, the ISO redshift could remove the No, I energy. agree. I just, I just put it that could, way just to make uh, my point, to be understood. This, but I, uh, I agree. This relation could delete the, uh, the dark energy, but not delete the expansion. And in that case, we recover the original proposal of Friedman Robertson work, where the, the, the dark energy is deleted, but the universe is expanded without the dark energy. This is the first, this is quite intriguing for me. Uh, maybe I think it's the, the most pro, 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 probably, uh, the, uh, a net probabil probability to be the, the, the correct solution. A second comment, uh, the theory that uh, Professor Mosquera Cuesta showed, that the paper that uh, we have uh, write, uh, written together, uh, there is a connection with the work of Professor De Vallette. In, uh, yeah. in this paper, <laughs> we modify Einstein gravity. Einstein, in uh, uh, the action of Einstein gravity, we have uh, that the action is uh, a linear function of the Ricci scalar. This is the, the reason because I have used it here, hey, hey, her. this is the Ricci scalar. Uh, in uh, our modification, we had a second uh, uh, parabolic function of the Ricci scala, where alpha, which multiplicates R square, has to be very, very small in order to uh, surpass the solar system uh, tests. And uh, what's very intriguing here, uh, we modify Einstein vision of gravitation. In Einstein vision of gravitation, uh, it is uh, the mass which curves the, the space-time. In this theory, is the, there are variations of space-time of space -time which generates the mass. In fact, if we take the field equation uh, of, uh, of this theory, of this particular uh, Lagrangian or action, it is the same, uh, we take the trace of, uh, the, uh, of the, the field equation, we obtain a Klein-Gordon equation which shows that the mass is generated by variation of the curvature of the Ricci scalar. And then uh, I think there, is, uh, the, uh, there are variation, uh, in, in that case, uh, wave variation of the curvature of the Ricci scalar. Exactly. Professor Laviolette exactly. mentioned. From it's another similar. point of view. A space science can do it, but in a different way in our understanding. OK. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Corda, for a comment. Next question, please. Okay, I have a question about, um, again, uh, life of uh, the universe, um, or age of the universe. Uh, did you ever look at with this, um, your new method, uh, when you get uh, regard of the redshift? You know that um, instead of redshift, when you have inserted 
ISO, ISO space? Yeah. Isotropic, yeah. ISO, ISO Minkowski or ISO Riemann, Riemann yeah. Santilli space yeah, Riemann, time? Yeah, uh, ISO, um, ISO Minkowski, I, ISO Santilli or ISO Santilli, Riemann Santilli, Santilli space time? Uh, space time. Uh, okay, well, uh, <laughs> the name is okay. Uh, anyhow, um, one uh, did applies you have flat did, did universe, you, one to curve you, it space time. Uh, I mean that uh, you, in your theory, did you uh, just equate the result? Or Which one? The, the equate the result to the uh, redshift that we know already, or your results are independent of redshift that we have already. We know that. And if it is so, then what does it give to us as a age of the universe? If I understood correctly, the uh, query is, Regarding this idea or the, the overall discussion on this data, from yes, yeah, yeah. In, in this case, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Good in this you. case, in this particular case, with this theory, we are able not only to show first that we do indeed in the light or coming from the supernovae is not dimming at all for no reason regarding expansion or, in the case of, of an oscillating universe, a contraction phase. Not even, not, it, it's not due to that. In our case, the change in the absolute value of the relative associated to a given source is due to the fact that it's light coming from the source to us throughout, found through intergalactic space, a huge, extended magnetic field. And light interacts with those magnetic fields and gets, uh, in some sense, a tire, like in their view, and you get the impression, if you are not attentive, that light is coming from a source that is receding much faster than it should be. And then, in our view is, we can clearly state that in this discussion, there is no need of a phase of faster acceleration, nor even that there is need of dark energy, there is no need of no, uh, dark matter, there is no need of anything else. Simply is because light going through, imagine that you put in front of this projector a, a particular magnetic field, light passing through, then what appears over there will be quite different as the one it's getting there right now with no feel in the, mid, in, the, in the middle. This is what our view. The fact that the space is, is filled in by its magnetic field, they are weak, but they are extensive enough. So light traversing through will find those fields and interacting with them gets its energy or its frequency being reduced. And that is the reason why you see them more resonant than normally, and then you conclude that they are dimming, and they are dimming because they are receding faster from us as compared to predicted, or the prediction by Einstein standard cosmology. So is it the same age, the age of the universe? The, the age of the universe yeah. kid is still the one that you can compute or infer from analyzing, for example, the data from the cosmic microwave background radiation. But this is, is very simple to do, because you get the oscillations in the CMB spectrum, and then you get the maximums of all of those models, those uh, modes, and by a simple analysis, you can extract the age of the universe. And since even if cosmic microwave background is undergoing this kind of interaction, the overall contribution, because the magnetic field from the far, very far universe are getting different waves of magnetic fields. On average, the global effect, the magnetic global effect is zero. But locally, you have different contribution, and those are what we are saying you need to take into account. Because the, there is no cosmic magnetic field at all. Nobody has seen such a thing. That means that locally, you have magnetic fields. But then here, you have this one pointing in this direction, you have this other one next to this, but pointing in another direction. When you make the average, you, have, you get zero, zero. 
And this is clear because there is no global magnetic field at all. And a, a cosmic axis related to a magnetic field, nobody has discovered. So that means that the magnetic fields are there because we measure Zeeman effects, Zeeman splitting, et cetera, et cetera, and we know that they are there. But we know also that in different directions, the effects are quite different. Then if you make an average, you get a clear conclusion. But it's easy to draw a conclusion by analyzing a specific sources. A supernova is very easy to analyze. And then you study the magnetic field in the middle, and then you get so, uh, uh, so, a small question in continuation of your explanation. Uh, in which way you account for the magnetic field? In a classical way or in a quantum way? Uh, which is it's a, a quantum formula? correction. It's a quantum correction. Thank you for, for this important question because I didn't put it. I think this in, is an important in, in issue this, because, uh, uh, in this point because after we understand that uh, the uh, magnetic field uh, um, affects the uh, yeah. shift. It, it, it's, it's, important. it's interesting because it relates to your comment yesterday and today because to the pioneer anomaly, but to attend specifically your yes, question. Yes, I am interested is, to know uh, how you account this, for. Uh, what, what we are doing, we scale about, I just, just show you what I said there. I would like to show you just what is my Lagrangian and then what is it? Uh, I pass uh, accelerated uh, just to. Uh, to make uh, our point, and uh, well, uh, what is this? Uh, I, I, I pass Rolni, is somewhere there. So, is it a nonlinear effect? Or? Yeah, it's a, it's a, what we call nonlinear is because there is an extra term in the Lagrangian that describes uh, Maxwell uh, electrodynamics. This is called a uh, nonlinear form of electrodynamics. I don't know if. Well, just to, it's the same thing there, but just to, the Lagrangian is, is this thing, which is Maxwell, and this gamma, I just will put it there, and this term here. This is the new Lagrangian, and from this term, you get the modification we are discussing. This gamma, this gamma is a universal constant, that this one is over there. Look the Lagrangian there, this one there. This is the reason why when you put the Lagrangian in the intergalactic medium where the weak, the field is very weak, this term gets dominant and then the overall effect, the dynamical overall effect is much stronger than the Maxwellian one. And then you get interesting effect. One of those is the one we discussed here. Uh, when inserted in the field equation, permit to remove a singularity in both of the origin of the universe and also to black holes. We have published a paper in, phys in modern physics letter where uh, we have shown that by inserting uh, this particular uh, Lagrangian in the right hand side of the Einstein field equation, the gravitational collapse is not singular. There is no black hole. It's a way to avoid the singularity that also you were discussing that there is no black hole at all. In indeed, we agree that the clearly. From an astrophysical point of view, many people say there is black hole in the, in the let's say, Sagittarius A star. But if you put more physics into the same problem to describe it properly, you get very different, different conclusions. If you put this Lagrangian together with Einstein term, this one, and make the dynamics, then you get the conclusion that the collapse of, your, of the gravitational collapse of your object gets refrained at some point, and then you get no radius like a structural radius, no way to get there. So uh, in continuation, is it the, the only reason of the introducing a new nonlinear term to the Lagrangian is to uh, account for the magnetic field in the intergalactic space, or there are some other reasons? Mm, let me let me see if I get the right point you are hitting to. You are so you introduced a new term, yeah. which is which means uh, some nonlinearity, which is uh, uh, which is uh, responsible for the for the shift. So so you see, you write time variation of the photon yeah, yeah. frequency. Yeah. 
time variation. Yeah, so yeah, is yeah. it the only is it the only reason uh, for uh, no no why so you introduce no certainly no there are most much more fundamental reasons that discussing a specific and particular problem like this one regarding the expansion of the universe in this particular direction no no there are fundamental reasons reasons in atomic physics that makes this introduction of terms or Lagrangian like this one into the physics to describe more properly the what's happening really at, at atomic scales because as you remember in order to avoid at least in the semi-classical description of the atomic uh, model of Bohr you need to avoid the collapse or the plunging into the nucleus of the electron which is orbiting by emitting energy as it accelerates around. So you need to introduce a modification of Maxwell Lagrangian with something else in order to avoid that the electron continues to radiate until plunging definitely onto the nucleus. The one way to do that is to modify Maxwell Lagrangian by introducing terms like this, like in bohr infield theory or like a, in Heisenberg-Euler theory, or this one that we introduced in Brazil. But there are some other options, but all of them are basically the first step into a quantum electrodynamical description of the same problem. And that is a fundamental reason. The, the application to this case we are discussing right now is just a simple consequence. But it's the same physics that applies. Sorry, so my, my understanding is that this term provides an, some extra shift to the Doppler or it, it is responsible It modifies the Doppler. Do, modifies. It modifies okay. the, what we call the Doppler. Uh, I'd like um, to say that you started uh, yes, your please. presentation uh, with a uh, Hubble-like plot for gamma radiation. But, but there was also super, uh, supernova there. It's difficult to believe that gamma radiation is affected by magnetic field or uh, some matter, uh, interstellar matters. This is my first question. And second question, if you have here expression for electromagnetic energy, magnetic tensor, which follows from your Lagrangian. Thank yes, you. yes, no. First of all, uh, the first uh, point is, uh, what you said, the modification we proposed, this one for example, it, it has many, many features, features that it addresses. But the one specific you said, we certainly can provide for the each intergalactic local last, like in this case this is the problem here is not extra galactic this is interplanetary space that we are discussing in this particular uh, case so what i'm getting, getting to you to your first question the theory applies everywhere as a very good theory and it, it, independent, it is independent of the frequency or wavelength of the light that we are discussing. Yes. If you lose gamma rays or light, visible light or wave, radio waves, it doesn't care about because the effect, the global effect, will be independent of the specific frequency. So it will be there, but only depends on the strength of the magnetic field on the background. And this is uh, the I am point. not convincing but because I think that in case of gamma rays, red sh shift is uh, determined only by Doppler shift. No, 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 no. Uh, our colleague is an expert in gamma ray physics, uh, observational. He could tell you more properly if you don't get my point. In this theory, if you go, look, I am very clear, L just look to this expression here. This is a variation in time of the frequency, of any frequency. Look, that in the other side, there is no frequency at all. Yeah, but, sorry to interrupt, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm an expert in gamma ray spectroscopy, I've been doing this 20 years. But his question he used to ask is, is and I have not seen it, because I've never done an experiment in a gamma ray in a high magnetic field, 
Yeah. My non, if you put it at high minus two, you're right. It does, it does not get bent up enough. So that is, so that, and that's basically to your question, is it a, a, a classical, if it's a classical effect, then the answer is no, gamma rays are not affected. I can put a gamma ray through a 20 Tesla high superconducting magnet and it will just go straight, okay? So the effect- No, no, I am saying there will be the same effect as in, with visible light or with radio waves. Wow. It's independent of the wow. frequency. You, no, no, anyway, I, I don't, I'll never put a this is, Look, this is magnetic field, this is magnetic field, this is magnetic field. There are no... By static magnetic field, okay? But I'm not an expert when it comes to quantum electric field or magnetism and its effect on radiation. So that's an area that I'm definitely not able to comment on. But in a classical sense, gamma ray is not affected by magnetic field, by static magnetic field. No, but there are proofs. There are proof, laboratory proofs of scattering of gamma rays in a, in a lab permeated by a magnetic field. It's published in physical review letters in 1997. But the, the, the problem is not that they degradate too much. It's not the case. It's that the interaction with the magnetic field okay. does exist. Yes, that's it. And the other point is the dynamics is, is clearly uh, uh, in these theories, it was for uh, not only for the problem that we were discussing, it's for everything else. Another, import another important point is that. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to Rio next year to run the uh, marathon there. Ah, okay, so great. I'll look up with you. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs>